Hello friends, welcome back to another episode of Theology in the Raw. I've got a few events coming up that you might want to know about. Uh, first of all, October 7th, I will be in Plano, Texas for the Revoice pre-conference doing a a uh, few hour talk on an introduction to the transgender conversation. And then in October, on October 20th and 21st in Boise, our faith, sexuality, and gender conference in Boise, Idaho, October 20th through the 21st. Uh, you can fly out to Boise, or if you're in Boise, just drive out to the location, um, or it will be live streamed. This is the first time we're ever live streaming one of these conferences, so check out all the details at centerforfaith.com. Go to the events page, and that should take you right to those events. Also, save the date, 2022, uh, March 31st through April 2nd, our first ever Theology in the Raw conference. We are going to discuss race, sexuality, gender, politics, hell, the environment, and many other things related to the gospel At the uh, as a gospel intersects our cultural moment. It's going to be it's going to be amazing. So save that date. We'll have details further down the road about the first ever Theology in the Raw conference in uh, 2022. All right, my guest today is a good friend of mine, Jay Newman. We go way back. Um, we didn't even talk about our uh, kind of how we got to know each other. I guess it doesn't really matter. But Jay, Jay has been a good friend over the years. Uh, he used to help run a Christian um, music festival called Audio Feed, and he first invited me to come out and speak at that mu music festival. This is coming up almost 10 years ago, and we've been friends ever since. Jay is uh what what is it well jay's job is he he uh he works at a barbecue joint in in east nashville um but i won't say but i'm gonna say and he has an incredible uh mind um he he's not a pastor he's not a writer he's not like a theologian um but the dude has he just has a very just a lot of natural intelligence and an a uncanny ability to kind of just think through tough issues and so I love I love talking to Jay about everything because he he'll have opinions about lots of things and he usually has usually <laughs> Jay usually not always but he usually has some really good thoughts on him. So in this episode we talk about um mostly we talk about Christian anarchy and what that is and what it isn't and that obviously will spill over into politics. This episode's raw, it's real, it's honest. It ha it has some edge edges that might need to be shaved off. So. I hope you will listen to it for what it is, um, and uh, yeah, hope it challenges you to think more deeply about uh, your own faith and your uh, position in relation to the governing authorities. So let's welcome back to the show, the one and only Jay Newman. All right, I'm here with my good friend, Jay Newman. Jay, thanks for coming on Theology in Raw. Here we'll we are. We'll see how this goes. <laughs> you see if your internet holds up. Yeah. Um, so we, I want to talk about Christian anarchy. I, I know this is something you've been studying for a while. You got some thoughts on it, and uh, you, you got to. I I trust your analysis of of stuff, so that's that's why I'm excited to have you on. Because some people, I, I don't know, I just don't know. I feel like I need to like, is it you know did that person really say that? Is that what that book says? But I feel like you got a good a good take on things, which is why I actually want to start from. Why don't we just start with some basics? What is Christian anarchy and what is it not? I would assume that there are more misunderstandings about what Christian anarchy is than probably any other kind of discipline. Would you agree with that? I and mean, when you hear people describe what they think Christian anarchy is, are you typically like, man, that's just not what it is? Or Well, so I'll give you, uh, you know, I like narrative, so I'll, I'll tell you a story. Um my French cousin, um, several years ago, we were talking about politics or whatever, and I think I was probably advocating for some libertarian or something like that. And so he said, have you read Jacques Ellul? And my cousin is French. Um, well, he's dual citizen, but he lives in France now, too, and was born there. But I'm like, oh, he's a Francophile. OK, who's this French guy or whatever? And so then I'm like, oh, Christian anarchy and just the word anarchy. Yeah. You, you almost immediately dismiss it. Right. Because um, you just think of like rebellion and chaos and like that's too far. That's too, you know, and you don't most people have already made up their mind that, well, we can't live in anarchy, you know. Um, and so I didn't really 
it was on my radar for a long time, but I didn't really dive into it. And I think in the last year of political turmoil is probably when I've kind of dug in deeper. And so I was telling a group of friends that over lunch had uh, about eight guys and they got to talking about politics and then January 6th comes up and um, I'm like, yeah, I think I'm now committed Christian anarchist. And like the table fell silent. And then they're all they're all older than me. And they're like, well, I remember when I was young, you know, I had leanings, you know, punk rock and anarchy. I'm like, no, that's not what this is. And like they just couldn't hear it. They could not hear it out. And one guy actually followed up with me and we're actually talking about it because he stepped, started telling me all these things. I'm like every every objection he had. Every objection. I'm like, that's not what Christian anarchy is. That's not what Christian anarchy is. Yeah. <laughs> so there, there's an immediately this misconception. And so I think maybe the first. what well, I think there's two points to, to consider before anyone who's listening <laughs> dismisses the idea uh, out of hand. Um, one is the meaning of the word anarchy. And, um, you know, language is fluid. So it's a it's a acquired all this meaning that just the root you're, I mean, and you're the Greek scholar here. I mean, it just means without ruler, you know, not being ruled. Um, without no ru- wait, wait, without ruler, not without, rulers. right. Without ruler. Yeah. Right. Right. Without a ruler. And so, you know, the hashtag that I've been using on Twitter, um, when I try to make my case in less than 280 characters is, uh, hashtag no King, but Christ. Mm-hmm. And so that's, that's the essence of Christian anarchy. It's not no ruler. It's anarchy towards political systems of the world. But you do have one ruler. And that's why anarchists. And so that's the other point that you need to consider is that true hardcore anarchists hate Christian anarchists because they think they're giving them a bad name ah. um, because they don't consider that true anarchy. Um, they legitimately want no rules and no rulers and just everyone do as everyone pleases. That is not Christian anarchy at all. Um, It is living under the lordship of only one and not conflicting that with any, any other uh, king or lordship or dominion. So when, when you realize that, then you're kind of like, if you're a Christian, you're kind of like, Oh, I, I believe that. I think I believe that. And so it's like, okay, there's the door. Let's keep, Let's let's see. And so what what I would uh, suggest to you, Preston, is that you already are a Christian anarchist. <laughs> uh, based on everything that I know about what you think the church's role is towards the state and based on, you know, the reason we're talking about this, because you put a tweet out and I'm like, that's Christian anar- anarchism, <laughs> you know, and it's like, that's what it is. Like, you, the live live like the exiles in Babylon. You know, that's that's basically it. Um, it's oversimplifying the idea, but I mean, that's it. So how, how no king but Christ. Um, but how, how does a Christian anarchist relate to or view the human ruler that is ruling over Babylon that they happen to be exiled in, into and, and, and the laws of the land and the Romans 13? I mean, you know, where I'm going with all this like. Um, yeah, well, I mean, and those are the objections people have. So it's uh, I, the exiles in Babylon is uh, pretty much the template. It's mm-hmm. like, no, you you be a good citizen. Okay, you don't you don't stir things up, but you know, in your heart, they don't rule you. You have not given them consent to rule your heart, um, and. You know, I I think of the Andy Dufresne from uh, Shawshank Redemption. You know, he's like they they can't imprison what's in here and points to his Mm -hmm. chest, you know, and it's like they they can do all this stuff, but they don't have me. They don't own me, Mm -hmm. you know, and um, and, in his mind, he's always going to be free from that place eventually. Mm -hmm. Um, And and that's that's I think what the, the Christian anarchist relationship towards the state is. You know, I'm like, I'm not not trying to upset your system. I just know it's not going to last. So I'm not loyal to it. 
So so far so good. Yeah, I could check all those boxes. So um, I'm gonna try to work my way out of being a Christian anarchist. I've been called a lot of things <laughs> in the podcast. I've been called a lesbian before. So um, yeah, Christian anarchist. How is that possible? <laughs> well, no, it was it was. Don't um, get into that. <laughs> Did you listen to that episode? It was uh No, I missed it. <laughs> okay, it was a uh, it was a uh, trans man. Um Scott Nugent okay. was on. So trans man, so he transitioned at 42 from female to male. Um and so before that, he I mean, Scott was a lesbian married to another woman. Um and so I I was interviewing him with my hat. Actually, I was I think it was the Elia had had on backwards. <laughs> I don't know. It kind of came out of nowhere. It's like, "Man, look at you. You look like a lesbian with your hat on back." When he's totally serious, you know. I'm like, "Wait, what?" <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if this is a lesbian look, but I'm sure you handled it better than I would have. Oh no, no, no. It was it was in jest. It was it was hilarious actually. Um <laughs> <laughs> uh, I so okay, so the laws of the land, um speed limits, um drinking age, pay your taxes. Th- these are things yeah. that we cuz I'm just thinking of like Romans 13, like my understanding of Romans 13 is um, hey, because God is your ruler, um, yeah, obey these laws. If they conflict in any way with, with your Christian allegiance, you, you're not under that authority. You're under God's authority. But, yeah, be, be a good citizen. Obey these laws. Uh, don't revolt. I think that's the main thrust behind Romans 13. Let's not, let's not right. you know, pursue some kind of revolution of Rome as Christians. Let's live quiet. Right. Quiet lives, put our heads down, know where our king is and be good citizens. Let's not be. I, I think the whole one of the points of a, the book of Acts is to show that I think this is Kevin Rowe, right? Um, that the Christian movement <laughs> was you, usurp, usurping, usurping the, um, the values of Rome without breaking any laws. Like they, they were good. Citizens. Every time right. they try to say you're doing something illegal, they beat them. They do all these things like, hey, name one law we've broken. We haven't done anything wrong. And yet they're preaching another king named Christ, you know. Um, the, and, and so that's that's one objection a lot of people have is that, well, how are we going to we, as a Christian, we should care about these issues in society and we need an entity like government to deal with them because they're just too big. And I point to the book of Acts. I'm like, no, you don't have to defer to the state to solve these issues. You know, you you can live as the community of Christ in this world and it inherently over time will upend the systems of power in this world. Just like the world was turned upside down as Acts said, mm. and Kevin Rose title of his book. Um, so it's like, we, we don't have to, and this is, this is the saddest part to me is that we have been conditioned for many generations to think the only way we can do what Christ wants is if we, uh, outsource our power to the state huh. and that's that's just a massive lie it's and, and we've done it for so so long that that's why we have this christian nationalism problem we can't separate them in our minds because we think the only way to be obedient to christ is to be obedient to the state and give mm-hmm. our power to them and it's like no these are conflicting powers they they, they they're not compatible if the to the degree that you give your power to the state, you do not live in the power of the spirit. What, what do you, you mean do not, give your power to the state by investing your energies in the state's attempt to fight injustice? Is that something like yeah, that? Yeah, well, you, you let them dictate the, the terms of those things, you know? Um, and so, I mean, a lot of that is like, and this this is where, okay, so here's where I'm going to lose some people. Th- that we vote. We've been told that voting, it, as Christians, we should vote for people who are going to accomplish through government what we think Christ wants done in the world. Well, that's practical blasphemy. You know, I mean, it, it's it's that was n- never what he said. And there's not a single reference where you can. That God always worked from underneath, you know. He, he, he mm-hmm. used his people to infiltrate. And, and, and even the, the, the one story we have where they say we want a king. And he said, no, you don't need a king. You got me. You know, um, and it didn't end well. And um, so where I lose people is saying, and I'm still kind of on the fence about this. I'm not like totally hardcore about it. 
but I'm currently under the impression that it, it might be a sin to vote. <laughs> you gotta lose some people there. <laughs> well, yeah, you're gonna lose, but gain. I mean, I get, I get, I feel like within my audience, I see both sides. People that are pro voting, and then people that are the same thing. Same thing. It's, they're not just indifferent. They're like, I think it's actually wrong to vote. So I've got a whole spectrum of people listen. But um, you're, you're not saying because I, I, I could hear people say, well, yeah, the Christians in the first century or throughout the scriptures. They didn't have the opportunity to vote. They weren't living in the kind of kind of uh, legislative kind. Of, what am I trying to say? The, their government system wasn't like ours. Like they didn't have the opportunity right. to, you know, it wasn't a democracy. So it's like it's an indirect parallel. Well, that's that's the brilliant uh, that's the brilliant move of uh, the powers that be that they have uh, gotten the people of God to conflate their uh, their power by thinking they have a voice in the government. We don't have a voice in what the government does. We, we, we think we do, and so we, we give our allegiance to it more easily because we think we're a part of it. But has, has it ever been government for the people, by the people? I mean, it's a nice idea. It doesn't function that way. And... I think it's like this really brilliant plan to make people feel like they're involved with the state. Like this is, this is the difference in say uh, the American church versus Constantine. Um, Constantine legalized Christianity. Um, Holy Roman emperor. He, uh, you know, conflated church and state and, you know, all of these had disastrous results, but this one is more sneaky. We we willingly are doing it thinking we are in charge, but the state is fundamentally more powerful than any human individual's uh, uh, interests. And it cannot no there is no state that is not antithetical to the kingdom of God on earth. Hmm. They, they don't work together. Now, that doesn't mean God won't use the state to accomplish his ends, which he says he will do in many places, but they cannot be conflated without one losing itself to the other. And it's always the church losing itself to the state always goes that way. What do you I don't disagree. I don't know enough to fully agree. I resonate with what you're saying based on just how I view church and state and being more of an anti-nationalist Christian and seeing this, the destructive nature of particularly the, the branch of Christianity that tries to wed itself to the state consciously or unconsciously um, and all that stuff. So the pushback that I have gotten, which is, I think, good, it goes along the lines of something Martin Luther King said many years ago. He said, because he, he was dealing with the same thing. Christian saying, you can't legislate people's hearts. You can't change. You got to change right. people's hearts. He goes, I agree, you can't legislate their hearts, but I can legislate people to stop lynching me, and I think that's pretty important too. So the pushback well, I get comes from particularly people of color or people who are lower on the socioeconomic rung to say you have the privilege to be kind of indifferent or not care about these things, but that state is not just not – it's not just that I don't – invest my energies in the state the state is oppressing me and so i need to stop them from oppressing me and that comes through partly through legislation like these unjust laws this unjust system is actually hurting me whereas you're kind of immune to it um so i'm not indifferent like i actually want to stop as best i can some of the injustices that the state's doing does that yeah no i'm with i'm with you on that and uh first of all did you hear did you hear the helicopters that just flew over my house? No. <laughs> it was five military helicopters in formation. And I'm just like, oh, my gosh, they hear what we're saying. They're coming for me. <laughs> oh, it's really weird. Really weird. Let me know if you got like a, a red a red laser on your house right now. <laughs> yeah. I'm just like, goodness gracious. No, but so I'm. I don't I don't think that the ideals of Christian anarchy are antithetical to um, trying to influence or persuade the state. Okay. Um, like 
and 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 I'll I'll go back to the you know Jews in exile, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Hmm. Um, they they were a part of the system, you know. Hmm. They were um, they allowed themselves. Well, they were offered an opportunity to be in the ruling class, and they accepted it. But they set themselves apart. They distinguished themselves in in several ways, you know. And ultimately, there was one distinction that that you know would have cost them their life if uh, the fourth man didn't show up in the fire, you know. And um, but they they said either way, either God will save us or we'll die. But we're not bowing to you, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, I I think there's a place for that. And another really great example, like. I mean, people think the force of the state is the only way to get things done, right? Um, like, I've heard so, uh, someone told me in in a conversation about this, like, well, well, what do you say about slavery? The only way we got rid of slavery was by fighting a war, you know. So, I mean, the the sword of the state is necessary for for true justice. And I'm like, no, I don't agree with that because the 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 British Empire ended slavery without a war. They did it from Christians who advocated William Wilberforce and all that. Like the Christians were being faithful and just continual advocacy won over the hearts. They won their hearts over. And then they, you know, I think they also, there were economic reasons where they realized that they were going to bleed themselves dry. But, you know, you can appeal to practical means as well when you're making your case for these things. But I don't think that means that, you know, you go, uh, build a Christian commune and just, you know, let come what may, I think we can be involved in the, uh, the processes around it's, 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 a, it's more of a matter of our, our heart's allegiance and, um, what we want and how we want to make it happen. So though, and it's a fine line. I mean, it's a fine line because you see people, advocating for christian justice through the government to me that's that's too far it's like christian justice god's justice i don't want to say god's justice will never come through the state i think sometimes it does but it won't come because god's people have outsourced their ability to perform justice to the state like we do justice and we show them how it's done and they change because of that we don't outsource our authority and protest and march and you know i unless it's a part of trying to get mlk i think that's the way to be honest just say hey here we are here's what we think um as far as starting militias and Hmm. you know the i'm thinking more of the current you know marches that we see that don't seem to be in line with any kind of view of uh god's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven you know, you talking um, about January six or? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm talking about that for sure. <laughs> and <laughs> you know, and then, uh, but and you know, the other side, there was a there's a group of uh, uh, there's a black militia, like you're not allowed in it if you have any other skin color, and they march with, uh, you know, AK-47s or whatever, you know, mm-hmm. military grade rifles, and they march and they just they haven't done anything violent, but they're they're threatening by their presence, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't think that's the way, you know, mm-hmm. I don't think we should be threatening, you know, um, I think we should be the, the, uh, the people set apart who demonstrate what true love, mercy, compassion, kindness, and justice are. Mm-hmm. But we get that from living in the spirit. We mm-hmm. don't get that from, from voting for somebody. Would it be, let me get, I'm just thinking as you're talking kind of an analogy or not an analogy, but like an example. So there's obviously problems in many uh, poor inner cities and big states in big cities um, with the school system, um, endless cycles of poverty and housing and crime. And it's just all a big mess in some places. Right. Um, yeah. So you could focus your energies on, I don't even know, like what le- legislation or, or different bills coming across and kind of like the state's attempt to rectify the situation. Or you can do what a lot of churches do and they go in and they reach out and they start uh, through relationships, reforming people's hearts and opening up other opportunities to get people out of 
out of gangs and they they reach out to single mothers who are trying to raise three kids or whatever so that their kids end up not you know getting sucked up into the cultural surroundings and stuff um there's some really i mean i've seen some i, I don't i don't know the names but i'm gonna read some stories about churches like in south chicago you know which is high crime and just all kinds of issues going on but churches that are really taking some risks but doing some amazing things that the government's trying to do but just doing it government t you know <laughs> it's just not um is that would that be and an example of what you do like, they, like like similar goals you know, reducing poverty, reducing crime, helping broken homes and, and kids growing up in this kind of environment. But so the goal is kind of the same, but it's a completely different means. I, I mean, I, I think the 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 difference is in is in the power structures. You know, when you let the government do it, the government's always going to be about subjugating people, whether they know whether the participants know it or not. That's what government is about, you know, and. So then it gets bogged down in bureaucracy and, and their end game is is not really to solve those problems. Those their end game is to uh, create a loyal citizenry, you know, and it's never completely uh, altruistic. I mean, it's there. There's always a self always. Sure. I, I hate sweeping statements, but most of the time there's a very self-serving. How can this help keep my power, or gain more power? <laughs> right. By doing the same. And I think Christians should do the same thing. I think Christians should. We're not it's it's not merely because this is the right thing to do. Um, it is there's a greater right thing that right. I want you to be a part of an experience. And this is the means to uh, bring you into that fold. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I don't want to cheapen it by saying that the only reason we do justice is for evangelism. I, I, it's not that cut and dry, but I, I don't I think they're so intertwined, though, if that's our motive then that is at the heart of what we're trying to do, you know, yeah. whether you give an altar call or not, doesn't matter. You know, that's still in the same way the state's trying to uh, kind of accomplish their ends and what they do. Well, Christians are also trying to accomplish their ends, yeah. which I would say is the Great Commission. And the Great Commission lived out a lot of times is just justice in your neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it doesn't have to be a, a revival service. So, mm -hmm. um but as you're talking, I mean, I'm thinking I just did school orientation for our boys. Got a second, fourth grader coming up and um, they're in a charter school. So it's kind of a hybrid. It's uh, it's city funded. So it it they do have state money, but they have autonomy to a degree to do to make their own rules in some ways. Um, so when all the other schools went back for a month before they shut down again, our school didn't do it. Uh, we just stayed at home the whole year this year, for example. But what this, this school came out of uh, one man's vision. He saw a problem. And uh, I'm in a neighborhood that has largely been gentrified, still in the process of it. But you see underserved communities being left out of high-end education or just, qual or just quality education. And you see the results of that high crime rates and all this. And it's like, if, if they could just get decent schooling, you, you would solve a lot of other problems in the neighborhoods, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And so he started this school with a few things in mind. And so, uh, our school is 70% black and Latino, which used to reflect the neighborhood, but now it's far more, uh, waspy. Mm -hmm. Um, but they're, they're still sticking to that, you know? And, um, they, uh, I think it's like 15%, um, there's an acronym that's the right way to say it, but I don't know the right way to say it right now. So forgive me, the disabled. Um, and, and so they're really targeting that. Um, and you know, and I'm like, this is good. This is good. And they are the number one school in the entire County out of like 180, every testing metric, math, science, reading, overall everything placement into top high schools like they they they're number one and so what's happened is you you saw bitterness from the metro schools um but now now you see emulation so they tried to like stop them because they were being so successful but now the tide has turned where you're starting to see metro change how they do things hmm. and so not only are they changing it for the students in this school they're going to change it for the students in the whole city right well i think 
in a way, that's the model for how Christians can impact their society. Like, we're going to show you the way. Mm-hmm. We're going to do it the right way as the Spirit leads through the power of Christ. We live out His kingdom, His the future. We live out the future in the present. Mm-hmm. We're going to live this out and show you what it looks like. And it will, it will change society. As, back to the book of Acts. It will do it. It won't do it. When we outsource our power and authority. So I would say in a lot of ways, a lot of our social ills are uh, we're the church has been responsible for not because they've neglected it directly, but because they've neglected it indirectly by giving the state the power to do it Hmm. when it's there. God has called Christians to do it, not the state. And so we've abdicated. Uh, we've abdicated our power. We've abdicated our authority. And um, I think that, uh, you know, again, Christian anarchy is a shocking term for most people who hear it for the first time. But I think we need to be shocked out of this because it's so embedded and ingrained in how we uh, think of ourselves as citizens in this place, in this country. It's so ingrained that it, we, we've got to really surgically get in there and start separating um, what's mm-hmm. good and what's not. Um, otherwise, we're going to keep getting, you know, uh, January 6th type things with, with uh, uh, a machine gun and a, and a Jesus saves poster with the same person. You know, it's like <laughs> I, we got to separate these things, you know, and why why in the world would a Christian march against the Capitol? It doesn't make any sense, you know. So anyway, I'm sure there's some people let's do this for a minute. The yeah. two scriptural things that I keep hearing over and over. So let's talk about the two big ones. You already mentioned Romans 13. Yeah. Um, so I guess we don't have to go back over that, but I love, I always refer people to what Stanley Harawa says. Where, uh, and the, the clips on YouTube, you can find it. But um, he basically is like, well, I still can't get past Romans 12, you know? And, and <laughs> He's like, and then he's like, how in the world would Romans 13 mean what you're saying when Romans 12 says this, you know? And so I would encourage people to look that up. I I, I don't have it memorized, so I can't quote it. But well, I said that in my in my book, Fight, now called Nonviolence. Um, Yeah, it's it's it. What's interesting is even the the death penalty passage in Romans 13, four is directly connected to Romans 12, 19 where God says, do not take vengeance. Vengeance is mine. I will repay. Those very same terms. I don't have the Greek text in front of me, but it's because Christians aren't supposed to do this, that God will take care of it. And one way in which God does it is through an imperfect, corrupt state in, in Romans 13. So it's it's one it's one thread of a single argument. And also, I think people are thrown off by that term, the servant of God. The government's the servant of God. Well, that term's used all over prophetic literature in the Old Testament to refer to the right. Assyrians who skin people yeah. alive, the Babylonians, the Persians. Like, it's it's not a happy, happy, clappy term. It's God is so sovereign that he will use these despicable people who are doing all kinds of evil. And he will bend their evil direction to serve his purpose in in an unjust in, in, in our fallen world. And, and so it seems like Paul's drawing on that kind of prophetic tradition by using the very same term, the servant of God. That's a very well-known prophetic term. So yeah, I, I think in, if you just open up your lens a little bit, Romans 13 is not, it's not celebrating the state at all, at all, um, but there still is. So even, even but there still is like be a good citizen, obey the laws. But I, again, you, you're not saying, don't do that. It's just I'm not. I'm saying be a good citizen um, strategically. Okay. <laughs> you know, know 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 who know where your real citizenship is, right? Mm-hmm. And and where they conflict. You know, I mean, it's. I don't even want. I've heard people describe it as dual citizenship. It's not even that. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I, it's, it's it's that that's a bad metaphor. I mean, it's like no. I'm a I'm a citizen of heaven i'm a citizen of god's kingdom um and i live here so a better metaphor and uh uh i i i don't know i i feel like he said it in several places 
that general idea nt Wright uses it all the time but like it's almost like that we're to be an embassy mm. in a foreign land you know that that's the church's role is to be an embassy huh. so you maintain your culture you maintain your um loyalties and allegiances and you know even how we treat ambassadors they're not subject to certain laws because we know like well they're not really citizens they just live here and they have a job to do here and so we respect that and we acknowledge that in diplomacy we we allow them to be citizens of this other place and live here and you know reap the benefits of living here but they they don't have to you know uh give that kind of allegiance away yeah so i think that's a, a better metaphor for how the church is to be in whatever country they are yeah you know yeah um, so let's go to the other scriptural one and yeah. i this is the main one I hear. First, and First uh, Peter 2? You going to First Peter 2? I'm not. Oh. We can do that too. And Jacques Ellul has a whole chapter on that in his okay. book, Christian Anarchy. So <laughs> we can do that. What I hear far more often is uh, render unto Caesar. Oh, right. Okay. Um, which, uh, you know, your buddy, your buddy, Derwin Gray, I, 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 I hit him with the hashtag, no king but Christ, and said Christians shouldn't vote. <laughs> and I, I think that that shocked him. And so he actually engaged with me and he said, you know, Jesus paid taxes. And I'm like, I didn't say don't pay taxes. I said, don't vote, you know. And so, you know, kind of fleshed it out a little bit. But um, that that's the first thing people go to. They're like, well, if you're paying taxes, you're showing loyalty. And I'm like, are you really trying to tell me in that episode that Jesus was deferring to Caesar, the king of the entire universe? held gold that he made in his hand with someone else's picture and said, Oh, now it's hit. Oh no, it's his. I mean, you're really trying to tell me that he's saying that, Oh, we share power. You give him what's his and give me what's mine. You're trying to tell me that he was saying, no, you can split your split the power. <laughs> Jesus was not in any way sharing his power with Caesar. All right. So what's going on in that passage? I remember reading NT Wright on this and he had a very different take. I would love to hear how you read that passage. Well, I think I just said it, but <laughs> I mean, I take it as very sarcastic. I take it as Jesus being very sarcastic. Okay. And I think it is Jesus being very clever to escape the trap that was being set for him. They're like, well, we're going to he's either going to show loyalty to Caesar and then all the people won't trust him anymore because they're looking for a revolutionary hero. And it's like or he's going to say something that is treasonous to the state and they're going to arrest him. Mm. And he really very cleverly and sarcastically got out of that trap. Hmm. You know, I think that's what was happening there. Well, historically, but, if you look at like Jewish history, um, not paying taxes, refusing to pay taxes is kind of the first step towards revolution. So and taxes were right. seen as kind of the first step or, or yeah, the first step towards ruling over somebody else. You subjugate them and right. you start collecting taxes. Like it was, it was, it was very symbolic and very, obviously a very practical way to subjugate somebody else to, you know, have them fund your empire. So there, I think there, right. there is, especially given the kind of air of revolution that surrounded Jesus throughout his ministry, when people were, you know, resisting, are we going to take over the kingdom now? Is now the time even acts one, right? Are we going to do it now? Are we, should we strap on our swords, you know? Um, yeah. So I, that, that, I think that's what NT Wright says, something similar. Like he's, he's got kind of a, tongue in cheek or yeah, kind of a sarcastic flair to what he's saying there. It's hard. It's hard to prove that from the text necessarily. You think, I mean, how do you, what if somebody says, no, I don't think he's being sarcastic. I mean, how do you, it's kind of hard well, to prove that, but I mean, he, from the text, he, they are trying to trap him. Yeah. For and sure. from the text, he escaped this trap in a very clever way. Yeah. But I, sometimes when I read these stories, I mean, and, you know, I, I, I like to do imaginative reading of the Gospels, you know, and which is why I love The Chosen. I love it. Yeah. And I don't, you know, I all of their depictions aren't what I would choose, but I think they're all, I have not seen a single one that I don't think is faithful to the text. Hmm. Um, so, but I, I love, you know, you, you have to kind of put yourself in the story in a way, you know, when you're reading, especially maybe more devotionally than, you know, uh, text critically or whatever. But I... Uh, I can't, uh, you, you like Seinfeld. Do you like Seinfeld? Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, when he's on his show, 
and he can't help but smirk when he's he knows he's about to deliver a line <laughs> like he knows it and like i picture jesus with that kind of smirk he's like I'm, I'm about to i'm about to give you this is going to be good and i picture him with that kind of that smirk on his face like i got a good yeah. one here you know and so that's i very much in that episode picture jesus kind of with a a half cock smile just being kind of smirky about it you know (laughs) um and again that's more my imaginative reading you know but well that does um, make it does make sense with how he has approached other similar episodes in the gospels where people are trying to trap him he never gives a straightforward response like yeah pharisees and sadducees and like which one's he going to side with and all of a sudden he says something that's like i'm not playing your game i'm not even in your i'm not my kingdom is so categorically different it doesn't fit into your different paradigms of what it looks like the, the, right. i, I want to go back to voting real, real quick Can we, <laughs> vote, okay you're on the border saying voting's a sin i'm, I'm going to give you an, uh, one last opportunity to walk that back a little bit <laughs> well okay let me let, let well, me that, let me I want to say one thing, though, before you you jump in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When people say, when people encourage other people to vote, there's always, 100% of the time, an an unstated assumption that you're going to vote for the person they want you to vote for. So when my right-wing relatives say, make sure you vote, I'm like, I I, I haven't done this yet. I I need to get the courage to do so. I'm like, oh, yes, I'm totally going to vote for Biden. They're like, no, no, no. Like, well, you just told me to vote. You didn't say, right. no, no, don't, don't, don't vote for Trump. Okay, so we'll just say that then. You need to vote for Trump, and you can see how stupid that sounds. But and then on the other side, too, on the left, we need to vote. We need to whatever. Like, okay, I'm going to vote for Trump. You know, like, no, no, don't do that. I'm like, well, you just told me to vote. Like, <laughs> So I, I, I want to encourage people, if they're like, we need to vote, at least be honest with you're really saying vote for this side, not that side. Right? I mean, at it's least really funny. don't just tell me just it's to really vote funny. as if you really just want me to go cast a vote for anybody. I mean, it's really funny. And I, I can say that I did not vote for Donald Trump any <laughs> opportunity that I was given to do that. So <laughs> I feel like you have to let people know that or they assume you did. Um, but <laughs> no, uh, right. I live in the one little blue dot in the middle of the Red Sea of Tennessee. Um, so while it might seem living in the South is uh, very pro-Trump, I don't, I don't leave my east nashville very often Hmm. and uh i don't get to see that like i very much think that i live in a blue world Hmm. you know and so all of the voting things i'm like you know people pressure you to vote and i'm like i don't know if you're gonna like how that's gonna go you know (laughs) and it's like and and you know generally i've for president anyway i've voted for third party and let me just say i have voted in every election i've been able to Hmm. um so uh, this is not something i have practiced yet Okay. And the 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 thing that's um, well, let me ask you: Do you think voting is a is a moral choice? No, no. But it's, where, it's, where I'm at now, I, I I hate talking about personal politics because I, I but yeah, I, I haven't voted in a long time. It hasn't been necessarily out of protest. If I did vote, it would almost likely be third party like you said i I think i i just my my nervousness with voting especially in this polarized age is that it's a symbol of allegiance to a tribe that i don't belong to look you can resonate with one side or the other you just made my case you just made my case that's it that's the whole point (laughs) is that it's a symbol of allegiance (laughs) yeah it's like it's like you're let me this is a uh an analogy i just came up with it's like well, are you a Dodger fan or a Giants fan? Go, going back to more important things right. in life here. Are you a Dodgers fan or a Giants fan? I'm like, well, I don't, I'm not playing baseball. I'm playing football. Like, I'm not even I, – I, you, the, right. these tribes you've yeah. created in this political right. spectrum where if you belong to one, then the other one's your enemy. You are creating a whole moral framework that I don't even recognize. I protest that. So, like, no, 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 I, I don't – and this is the danger – I think – years ago it wouldn't have been so much like that like you can vote democrat doesn't mean you're anti everybody on the right or vice versa uh, but now it's almost like if you symbolically give any kind of like allegiance to one side or the other then you are on that team 
And that team, to be on that team, you have to hate the other team. And you have to think the other team is not just wrong but evil. And it's like this whole moral world is destructive and very anti-Christian and kingdom. So that's my nervousness with voting now. Now, I could I could theoretically vote in the private of my heart, not tell anybody whatever. And, you know, if people ask, say, I'm not even going to tell you because I don't want you to think I'm on a certain team. Um but I don't know now. Now the the our media and everything's so powerful. That even if I just voted in the private of my heart, whatever, and didn't tell anybody, it still has that sense of like, this is my team, and that's that's the enemy. We need to destroy. Like it just I don't know. It can fuel that kind of posture. Is that so? Back back to what I told you. You <laughs> I, already I'm not going to are... say it's a sin to. I'm still not going to say it's a sin to vote. Okay. I just think it. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'll let me let me unpack that because I know that's a little, that's a that's got a little sting to it, but. Uh, but first, you already are a Christian anarchist. <laughs> you already are. So, I mean, you know, if you can just get pa- past it and uh, it, I mean, everything you're saying is that. So here's why I say it's a sin. Let me hold on. Sorry, I need a little caffeine boost for, for this one. Um, so the 81 percent, you know what I mean when I say that? I don't even have to explain it. The 81 percent of evangelicals oh, gosh, yeah. who voted for Trump. Right. So. For four years plus now. We're told that the church is culpable for Donald Trump, like that they everything that he did, good, you know, good or bad, I guess. But mostly you're talking about bad. The church is responsible for because they put him there. Right. And so. In this most recent election, I started to see a real double standard when people were trying to make their case for who you should vote for. um, And they're really trying to turn that evangelical tide to maybe, you know, vote for Biden, you know, turn blue at least this one time. Um, See how bad it was or whatever. Look how bad it's been for the church. And I'm talking about Christian people, you know, making this case. And I'm like, you're not applying the same metric. You're not. it, It is such a double standard. Oh, so you're responsible for the evil of Donald Trump, but you're not responsible for the evil of the next guy. Huh. Like if you voted for him and you endorsed him. And then I started to think when we stand before the judgment seat of Christ and we'll be judged for everything. And thank God it's a merciful judge. But I think we're still going to be called out on things. Do you think to some level we're culpable of the person we gave our endorsement to huh. with our vote with our state mandated say in what happens are we not going to have some measure of culpability for every drone strike for for every because we endorsed it we said so i that's why i think it might be a sin it's like you put him there like you gave him you gave this man so far there's not been a woman you gave this man the authority you endorsed his authority to do what he's doing he didn't do it over and against you like in the old days where a king just did as he pleased and the people could not be held culpable for that you endorse that so you're you're agreeing, may, are you agreeing with the logic then that a vote is endorsing i don't know we uh, if we can undo that logic then maybe it's not a sin but if that's what we're going to say then the logical conclusion is that you are culpable hmm. for who you voted for so we need to go back and say if you're not If you're not morally culpable for the deeds of who you voted for, then let's stop talking that way. I would lean, I would lean towards that. That's, and that, I don't know. What what do you think about that 81%? Like I just see so many problems as someone who was in, well, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. 81% of evangelicals who, first of all, it's who voted, voted for Trump. Right. There's a lot of people didn't vote or, you know, um, okay, so who voted voted for Trump? But then you gotta come on, dude. Like, let's at least ask the question: Why? What was the other option? How many said I don't like either right. of these two candidates, but this one's slightly worse than this one? So I'm gonna. Um, what about people who are just? I, I know people get on the the kind of one issue voting, but like, I mean, abortion is are, kind of. Are the, you gonna say lesser of two evils? It sounds like what you're about to say. Well. Uh, a spectrum of lesser two evils though like people that held their nose and voted for trump also consider the other candidate like how many how how much wait wait i I need to word this right yeah how much of the democratic party is culpable for the trump vote because they put up at least in 2016 a pretty garbage candidate like this is the this is yeah 
basically a female Trump? Do you want male Trump or do you want female Trump? <laughs> yeah <laughs> they're they're both like morally bankrupt you can't trust them they're power grabbing they're sick and twisted you know and um and, and then there's the hypocrisy of like okay here i'm gonna go here i was thinking about this the other day ah uh, should i go here no nah, i don't know well if you're already saying it just go there i i just there is a, a certain level of moral hypocrisy when people are troubled by trump's sexual immorality when 70 percent of people are watching other men on porn grab other women by their right pee. yeah I, i'm yeah, not yeah. i'm not i'm not excusing anything i'm just saying like this outrage how could you oh he's so bad i'm like you put a hot mic up to your brain your private conversations your screen and let's see what's revealed Right. <laughs> and right, I'm, yeah. again, I'm, not, I'm not saying like you're evil. I'm just well, saying can... like, let's 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 at least have the humility and kind of like the guy banging his chest. You know, woe is me. I'm a sin. I'm the sinner. You know, like this, like, no, I'm I'm you. You break open my heart and you can see all kinds of darkness and corruption and stuff. Not to excuse it when people do it publicly, not to excuse it when a public figure, a leader is doing that. But it's like. And I've said this, I've said I've said this before. Trump is a mirror to the American person, the the American male. No, I mean, yeah, narcissistic. Yeah, that's America. Yeah. Immoral. Yeah, that's America. Uh, uh, that's America. They lie. He's after power. Mm, that's pretty much most Americans. <laughs> so right. it's like I, to me, the the pro Trump hysteria is just as dangerous as the anti-trump hysteria because you are investing messianic messianic expectations whatever in a babylonian ruler and every so you're gonna say it one more time you are a christian yeah, anarchist. you are yeah <laughs> i mean that is the thing is like that the, 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 they're they're all morally bankrupt and I, I think it's directly related to their positions of power you right. know i mean it, it, power corrupts yeah. You know, and uh, only Jesus has the moral authority to be in power um, without being stained by it. So uh, that's what we believe as Christians. Uh, we don't seek that kind of power. Um, we defer. I mean, that's the whole part of your anybody's testimony or conversion experience is the giving over of that power to the one king, you know, mm -hmm. to follow him and, and uh, obey him. Because he's the only one who can have that power. No individual can even have that power over their own life, much less over an entire country. So, yeah. you know, good people don't seek that kind of power. So you can just basically assume whoever's trying to get that kind of power is probably not a good person. And um, morally, morally, I mean, because there's lots of ways you can say good. I mean, I, did you see the news last week? Ken Starr, you know, the guy who led the investigation on uh, on uh, Bill Clinton? No, I didn't um, think so. Do I, he was having an affair during those trials. <laughs> he had sexual improprieties as he was calling out Bill Clinton. And it shows wow. that he didn't care about the morality of, of Clinton. Yeah. It was about power. Yeah. You know, it was about getting this person out of power and getting his team in power. That's yeah. all it was ever about. It was never about the morality of it. But how did how did they sell it? They sold it as, you know, the moral majority all the way back to Falwell and, you know, this Christian ethic that we expect from our government. And it's like, it's fake. They yeah. tell you that to get your votes. Yeah. They're, they're tricking you. Yeah. And we've let them trick us for so long. <laughs> but we've met, they've convinced us they're on our team and they're for us. Mm -hmm. That's why all these Christians voted for Trump. They say Trump's the guy who's going to step up and speak for us. Like, no, only Jesus does that. Yeah. Like, yeah. you, you don't need an advocate. You don't need an ad We have an advocate. It's mm -hmm. called the Holy Spirit. You don't need a politician to advocate for the church. Mm -hmm. You don't need it. And if they tell you that they are going to do it, they're only manipulating you. And we've been manipulated for a long time. Yeah. And that's why this is even a hard conversation for people to have, because they're going to have to look inside and realize you've been duped. Mm -hmm. I have to look inside and say, I've been duped. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. you you said the Pledge of Allegiance. You've been duped. You know, you say, you know, you take your hat off the Star Spangled Banner and sing along. You've been duped. You know, they've convinced you that these things are compatible, that your Christian faith can be lived out through 
the power of the state Mm -hmm. that if America does well, then the church, then the kingdom of God does well. No, they're antithetical. (laughs) They don't work. It don't work that way. And we're seeing the the repercussions of that. Yeah, I I 100 percent agree. I've man, so many different directions. I, real quick, since you touched on the pledge and the Star Spangled Banner, uh, I don't pledge. Um, I do stand. If anybody stands, yeah, with, and, and with, the, call with the Star Spangled Banner, I also stand. I take my hat off, and I I put my hands behind my back. Um, sure. I don't put my hand over my heart, and, and these are all fine lines. And I'm not. Please, if somebody's sure, like, sure, sure. no, I do all that. I, I'm not. These are tough issues. I don't pledge the allegiance because I think that's it's adopting religious language that I again, good citizen, obey the state, keep your head down. You have quiet indifference to <laughs> the laws of the land, but you obey them. Hey, I'm gonna be a good. So you want me to drive sure. 35? I'll try to drive 35. Um, uh, but I'm not my legion. I can't give my my allegiance is not to the state. My, my I might obey the state in as much as it's not conflicting with my allegiance to Jesus. My allegiance isn't to the state. Um, Star Spangled Banner. I mean, that song, you listen to the lyrics, I'm like, man. Um, uh, so, but in, in, the, in the hand over the heart, to me, is a symbol of allegiance. And I, I just, I can't go there. I stand. I don't, I don't kneel or, or turn around because I, I'm still trying to be respectful to, to Babylon and this, 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 sure, this event that they're doing. I, I want to be, I want to, I'll respect you guys. You know, I'm not going to protest necessarily what you're doing in this moment, but, I'm not going to give my allegiance to it. What do you, what do you think about that? Is that, and I don't know if I'm, I, I might change my well, mind tomorrow on some of those things. I just, the, the, thing, the, the thing I thought of as you were saying that, I mean, I, I think respectful is, is, is the word you mm-hmm. want to be respectful, but the, I, you know, I've, I've, I've been, I've traveled a lot and, um, I've been in Hindu temples and I've, I've been, um, yeah. I've been in, uh, I've attended a Muslim prayer service in the middle East, you know, and, I'm respectful. Yeah. Take your shoes off before you, know? you enter the temple. You, yeah. yeah. You, 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 you adhere to the protocols to show respect, but that's not the same as deference. Right. Right. That's not, that's not in, and in, in, in the same way, I, 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 uh, I attribute it to how you would act when anyone's worshiping a false God, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I love it. So, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I gotta write that. Yeah, that was good. Hold on a sec. I gotta write that down. <laughs> All right. Um, so, how do we? Because I mean, do you see it's it's kind of the, of course you see it. I mean, everything we're saying is not the view of the overwhelming majority of the evangelical church. And every sing, every single pastor, I t- well, ninety percent of the pastors I talk to say this political allegiance in their congregation has disrupted their discipleship journey like nothing I've seen before. Um, the only, yeah. And it's typically on the right, right? It's, it's the Christian nationalistic yeah. spirit. It's well, the, it gets more subtle. It's more subtle on the left, but if, if you go and go back and look at people's tweets or just go listen to how people were talking at the inauguration, I mean, they were using religious language. They were talking about, yeah. you know, the dawn has come. The light is breaking through the darkness. Um, they were using it. I, I saw people say that they felt the Holy Spirit present at, at, the, at the inauguration. And they, they were thanking God, but they were still saying, I'm like, you're saying the Holy Spirit has endorsed this? Do you know what uh-huh. he's about to do and sign off on? Because if you're saying the Holy Spirit endorsed that, <laughs> how is that? <laughs> Uh, I, then I got problems with the Holy Spirit. I mean, I'm sure some people in Yemen have a problem with the Holy Spirit if he's endorsing that, you know? <laughs> um, and, and so it, it's, I, 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 I was saying I, more just numerically, like when you take it like the sure. broad evangelical church, sure. there's a much numerical problem with people being in bed Here's with the right wing. I'm going to point, point, point out to you because almost no one notices. It's very subtle. It's very subtle. And I think it's, uh, almost, uh, yeah, uh, like a, uh, mnemonic device type of thing but um or whatever that would be for a visual but um they frequently you will see pictures of biden from a press conference or anything like that and they got the the seal you know the presidential seal behind his head 
they frame his head right in the middle of the seal to where the, the presidential seal looks like a halo. And it's like a, it's like a portrait of a saint, hmm. like one of the, one of the, you know, one of the Byzantine portraits of sainthood. And so they frame that thing right around his head to where there's this yellow circle right around his head. And it's like, you can't tell me that's an accident because they keep doing it. Is that every you know? candidate? Is that do they do that with every presidential candidate? I've never or? noticed it before. Never noticed it before. Hmm. I don't know. I have to go back and look. I ne- I only noticed it with with in like January and February. I started seeing it a lot. Huh. So it's uh, yeah, come on, y'all. <laughs> okay, you couldn't be more clear about worshiping. You know, it, you're conflating things and saying that this person is endorsed by Christ is yeah. what you're saying if he's a saint. You know, yeah. um, so. Um, and that, which is funny because the Catholic Church is about is, is talking about revoking his communion privileges. Really? <laughs> oh, you didn't see that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, over I, his I stance on I abortion. Yeah. yeah. Well, they were talking about uh, the bishops um, were talking about uh, disallowing him communion, um, and I don't think it went through. Um, but it, it it was public news, you know, that they were considering that. So, uh, <laughs> just mm-hmm. kind of funny. Um, but anyway, that's what yeah, the Protestant I, I, church. Yeah, that's what that's what I appreciate about the Catholic church. They have the power to do that. Whereas, I mean, they should have done that with Trump, but he was Protestant, right? Protestant in, in name. Right. So the, no one well, had the power to say, yeah, you too, bro. You can't you get, get your fingers away from my bread and wine. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. So which is interesting, too, because, you know. I don't think we should deny communion to anyone who wants to receive it, hmm. you know, uh, with the right heart and attitude. Um, with repentance, you know, I think even a president can be pardoned of their sins. Right. Um, right. But um, yeah, I, but anyway, uh, I don't, I think, so going back to what you said about pastors and talking about the divisions and the difficulties in discipleship, that's, that's why I think it's important for us to start delving into an already established uh, uh what do you what would you call it a already established line of thought that's not what i really want to say but anyway uh, christian anarchy is not like a new thing you know i mean it's it's been talked about uh it's an ideology there you go that's what i'm looking for yeah. um and let's let's revisit this we've dismissed it too easily in the past and when you read people who have wrote, written thoughtfully about it you got Jacques Lula who by the way, is way ahead of his time on many topics. If you read him on technology, you yeah. think he would have wrote this year, wow. but he died in ninety early nineties. Wow. Never even saw the internet. So, wow. um, if you read his work on technology, it's it is prescient. Wow. Um, but um, but you know he writes about uh, Christian anarchy. Leo Tolstoy wrote quite yeah. a bit about it, and you know he lived through uh, the the. Bolshevik revolution and, and all of that. And, yeah. you know, and, and so his thoughts were framed by that uh, right here. One of the biggest American proponents has, has been uh, David Lipscomb, oh, Lipscomb yeah. University here in Nashville. He's the founder of that. He, he wrote quite a bit about the concept. And, you know, it goes as far back as like the Mennonites and Moravian Brethren. Um, and, and, you know, it, it, a lot of it comes from the Reformation, you know. And you can trace it back even farther if you want. You can look at the early church fa- fathers, where I think I can't remember which church father it was. Um, one of the big ones, Athanasius. I don't know. Don't quote me on this one. But there, there, I saw someone putting a list for to even go into the building of uh, the church school, which they they would have activities throughout the week. Um, that that a prostitute would have to renounce her livelihood before she could even enter the building um but and then i saw i can't remember the historian who was talking about it. it was like is it just them he's like no and soldiers would have to as well you know like soldiers would have to renounce their career mm-hmm. to even set foot in the church and that that was the attitude from you know the first few centuries of christianity to how it's flipped now where you got this god and country you know kind of thing where they're so enmeshed the church used to think if you were a soldier, you were in sin. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, well, they had we get... a, a lot of the early documents. Um, and this goes back, gosh, almost 10 years for me when I, I work, cause I have, a, I have a whole chapter in, in fight now called nonviolence um, on the early church. And, and 
it, I was really focusing on nonviolence and how the early church, this was almost like a cardinal doctrine that Christians should never kill somebody no matter what. And they did exactly what you're saying. I, mean, there's, I have documentation in, in that chapter on the early church kind of there was a kind of a debate I, would they allow a soldier to have communion or even yeah enter a church or you know what what kind of repentance would they have to do as be at, by nature of their soldiering um to be able to belong to the church community again and it was a it was a live debate but can you imagine today <laughs> i know i know like that say that, that and it, yeah it's crazy man i i mean i I don't know, man. I, I feel like pastors and leaders in as much as they are like, yes, I see what you're saying. I might not line up on everything, but yes, this political partisan allegiance is, 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 is hindering the mission of the church. But if you start preaching against it, your church is going to dwindle for the most part. Um, go for it though. I, and that's, I, that's, the, that's, I don't, I don't want to downplay the financial and all this stuff that would happen if your church gets, it becomes a fraction of the size, but I'm just, if, if it's genuinely stunting people's discipleship, then we need to start addressing it, calling it out. Well, man. and mean, you don't have to go in guns blazing, uh, pardon the metaphor, but, um, <laughs> yeah, you, you know, you can read up on some of these people who have written on Christian anarchy and you can start introducing ideas more subtly then just do an exposition of Christian yeah. anarchy, which is going to be off putting, you know, off the bat. Well, I, I don't think they should use a term. I don't think up. they should use a name. I think Christian anarchy, I think it needs to rebrand itself or just like you can, you can talk about everything we're talking about without using that term. That term is going yeah, to be a. I, I like it. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, um, but, you're... <laughs> but you would but agree I, you that know, if, yeah. if, if, if the term is a, is just going to, is going to be too much of a hang up, then just present the ideas, which I, I feel like. Well, yeah, there, there's there's levels of both. I mean, I think in some ways you need to shock people like, oh, what do you wait? What do you mean? You know, um, and so that gets you in the conversation because it's intriguing and people want to understand what you're saying It's like, well, I know you surely you're not advocate advocating chaos. You know, I'm like, no, I'm not. You know, that's not what the idea is. Let's and, you know, what basically everything I've said on this podcast, you know, that we can talk about this and. I think that a lot of uh, humble and thoughtful followers of Christ would would acquiesce, as I've said, that you are a Christian anarchist. You just don't call it that. That a lot of people are. A lot of people are. But if enough people started saying that's the thing, that's going to cause curiosity, and people are going to realize this is not compatible with what I think of my faith. And then they're going to have to be faced with the idea, do we even have the same faith and which one's right? And so they're going to have to ask hard questions right now. The question's not even asked. It's to in their minds. They don't think uh, deeply enough about it. They can live in loyalty to, this, to the state and Jesus. Most Christians in this country. Most I'm comfortable saying most think that that is possible and they need to be shocked out of it. They they, 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 they've got, there needs to be a jolt to the system mm -hmm. for them to realize other, I mean, because it's so deeply ingrained mm -hmm. that it, it's not going to be this kind of, um, you know, you know, slowly just kind of, at some point you're going to have to say, you've been blaspheming, you know, at some point you're going to have to say, you're committing idolatry and I call you to repent. You know, at some point, otherwise, it's just going to keep going. There's not going to be any difference or change. How, how, does, you how does your church handle it? Handle what in particular? Well, I, well, your church is, I'm going to assume, is a lot more punk rock than most churches. That it, it would probably, most of them are probably already there. Or they would be, they'd err on the side of the left, right? I would assume. Or I would say the majority. We definitely have a couple uh outspoken trump supporters but really um but yeah they're, they're the minority for sure um so yeah i mean i think our church handles it uh well josh our pastor and and my uh co-host of my podcast which i haven't mentioned catacomb podcast yet go but you gotta out. go listen to my podcast with my pastor catacomb podcast Go uh, subscribe, leave a review if you're on uh, Apple, <laughs> leave five stars, 
trust me, you don't have to listen to one. You'll like it. Um, <laughs> but anyway, Josh's approach has been um, to try to say, stop getting caught up in this. Let's focus on the work of the kingdom. Mm-hmm. And that that's how we rise above this. Like this, this basically his sermons have, he's, he's, he can be gentle um, when he knows it's controversial, but um, in a, in a kind of gentle, but also confrontational way saying like, this is a distraction yeah. to what we're trying to do here. Mm-hmm. So, and it's, and it's, and it's hurting your soul. I see your Facebook posts, like you're not in a good frame of mind, clearly, you know? Mm-hmm. So um, he's more focused on people healing and being whole and it is, it's harming people. It's harming people's souls. It's, it's stressing them out. It's causing them angst and anxiety. Mm-hmm. And like, that's, that's not, uh, what Christ has redeemed us to live like, yeah. you know, um, we should be liberated from this. So there, he's pointing out a kind of, uh, internal bondage that this has created for people. So he's more focused on that because he's, uh, at his heart, he's a spiritual director and, um, you know, he's more focused on people's, uh, uh, healing and, and wholeness. Mm-hmm. So I guess that's the way he's approaching that. Yeah. Um, but as far as, you know, drawing that hard line, you know, that's up to me, I, I guess, on, as, on our podcast anyway, for sure, where I'm just like, we had a great episode um, with an uh, actual candidate for governor in the state of Arkansas. It's one of our more recent episodes. Hmm. And so we, we talked about this a little bit and he's a libertarian candidate, but he's also a, a prison chaplain. Um, and so we talked a little bit about how he uh, views his role uh, as someone who wants to be in politics, but is doing it in his mind for the cause of Christ. And, and so, you know, there was a, a good little back and forth there. But in the end, I think he agreed with the heart behind what you and I are saying here. Um, but in his conclusion, he's like, but I'm still going to try to do this. And he also kind of knows he's not going to be the governor, (laughs) you know, he's running on the libertarian candidate ticket, you know? So it's more about, um, introducing ideas into the conversation Mm -hmm. and having people think about something that wouldn't even be brought up if he wasn't there. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and that's consistent with, with kind of what I've said as well. So, um, but it's, it's a good episode. Um, it, he would be the first black governor of, of Arkansas hmm. if he were to somehow pull that off. But hmm. um, yeah. there's 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 really no way. <laughs> um, but anyway, yeah. I mean, I, I just I want out, you know, that's mm-hmm. at the end of the day. I want out. I want out of this mess. I don't I don't. It's like you said, he's like, uh, well, which baseball team you like? He's like, ah, I'm an Eagles fan. I don't know. You know, I, I follow football, <laughs> you know, right? It's like, I, I don't know what you're talking about. I, I want out of that. I want out of that uh, constant uh, linear dichotomy, you know? I yeah, want to, yeah, yeah. uh, so, and, and and that's not to be kind of like so heavenly minded, you're no earthly good either. No, which it's is a what different, you it's, a, it's a whole different paradigm for being an earthly good. Yeah, right. right. And, and yeah, that critique that. assumes that the paradigm, the political the American partisan paradigm is the only paradigm through which we can operate. Right. And so even the very accusation you're too heavily minded for any earthly good is just so narrow, really like the only way to be earthly good is to be partisan. (laughs) That's how deep the hooks are in. That's how deep the hooks are in and how manipulated we've been. And that's, that's, it's hard to convince people they've been duped. It's hard to convince people they've been manipulated Mm -hmm. because it's so deeply ingrained. And so that is the real challenge for this conversation is helping people realize that you you've been lied to, not just by the current politicians of your lifetime, but a whole litany of generations before have handed you this heritage of sacrificing the authority that Christ wants to give you and your community. And, and it's really hard to accept, really hard to accept. So, you know, gentleness has to be done but at some point you just have to be like those don't work you're you're stuck on this paradigm of left and right and jesus is calling you up and out you know um he's not calling you to the left or the right you know Mm -hmm. he's calling you to be redeemed and then be witnesses i don't want to squeeze too much out of it but there's that command in uh, revelation 18 i think 
when it's this v- ferocious critique of Babylon, i.e. Rome, i.e. any, I think, all uh, earthly governing systems, um, and he says, come out of her. <laughs> yeah. You know that? And it's yeah, it, yeah, within, yeah. within the context of Revelation 18 and 19, or seven, Revelation 17 and 18, it's really powerful. It's really, I think Richard Bauckham, um, oh, if I remember correctly, it's been a while, either Bauckham or maybe N.T. Wright or somebody kind of says that this is kind of a climactic statement about Christians removing themselves from the very systems, maybe not actually, but spiritually, if, if that makes sense. Any sense, yeah, you know? um, it is. I mean, and it's 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 your heart, you know. It's uh, it's hard to really live out the Shema <laughs> and uh, and be loyal to the state, like practically impossible. <laughs> you know, I, I just don't think you can. Uh, and we, and I, I try to do this with our boys. We don't do it every day. We probably should do better at that, but we we recite it. You know, it's uh, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. You know, um, and and we say our family is a hero. Newman's, our God is one. <laughs> you will love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. Um, so I just I pulled out um, just because uh, I don't know if you're doing video here. Yeah, or yeah, not, it's video. But yeah, this is YouTube. I got this yeah. is my copy of Jacques Ellul, uh, Anarchy and Christianity. And if you look at the contents here, you see that he goes through the Hebrew scriptures yeah, and then the Gospels and then Revelation and then uh, First Peter and Paul. And it's just like, I mean, it's he's not a, a, a biblical theologian, but he does. He, he did have some seminary training huh. um, and, you know, just goes. I mean, just goes through it. I mean, highly recommend reading. It's not that long of a book. Highly recommend hmm. just this. It is the, the best case that you can read. Wow. Um, and, you know, you can Google David Lipscomb and Tolstoy has some essays that are quite compelling. But if you want to start off that, that's it. Jacques Ellul, Anarchy and Christianity. And like, it's just like I'm reading through this and he started off as a Marxist. Uh-huh. Uh, he talks about in his introduction that he began as a Marxist and through, uh, you know, the events of the early 20th century with uh, um, socialism, communism, and then the world wars, like he came out of that. And I think he wrote this book in the 50s. Wow. Um, so I, 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 we don't, I, I think people, the powers that be don't want us discussing this. Hmm. It is, it is, um, it undermines what they're trying to accomplish mm-hmm. in their in their agenda of manipulating the church, and I've all, I, I think that politicians, powers that be, inherently see the church as powerful, mm-hmm. and they know it's a competitor, and so they're always trying to co-opt it to try yeah. to take that power for themselves, and so that's why I go as far as to say voting is wrong because. That is an act of the state trying to take their, they see you have power. They want that power Hmm. and you're acquiescing it. You have to stop and you say, no, we already have the power. We already by the authority of Christ in the presence of the Holy spirit, we are the most powerful force on the planet. Hmm. We are his people. We are his presence here. What's bigger and stronger than that. Now you might not like the way that things get done, Things get done by, you know, loving your neighbor, uh, praying for your enemies. Things get done by dying on a cross. Mm-hmm. But that's that's how the world's upended, not through political means. I, I, want, you so know? I, it, I do have to state one more time because pr- propaganda, I just had him on, brought this up. Um, why the majority of black people in America are very concerned about politics. Um, and he said, you know, and I know we've already kind of touched on this, but I want to touch on it again so I don't come off as tone deaf. Um, black people in America haven't had the privilege to be able to not care about politics. Um, we've been deeply right. affected by politics. How would you respond to that? Um, I mean, we got, I would yeah, respond by, two white guys, by, two white guys, you, <laughs> treading a fine line here, but 
Well, I, I think the church should should look to um, I think the the white church should look to the black church as an example, to be honest. I think the black church gets it. Um, the relationship between the the church and the state far better than the white church has. Hmm. And I think they should be a model for how we ought to interact with the state, because, you know, you have a lot of people saying, well, it's not really my country. You know, um, you know, you, you have people say, I went and fought for the for this country in the war and I come back and, and I'm the second class citizen. You know, yeah. I mean, that's the story of so many. Um, and that's uh, right in a way, hmm. you know, I mean, it's not right of the state to do that. And it's not right for them to uh, be made out to be second class citizens. But in some ways. I think Christ is calling us to a kind of second class citizenry when it comes to the state, hmm. you know, and I think we have a lot to learn there from them. And that that is not to negate the kind of advocacy and speaking up for justice. I'm not saying to just go hide in a hole, but I'm saying there's an attitude of the heart that says this is my country, but it's not, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. this is where I was born, this is where I was raised. Th this is not where I belong. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So this is sense of belonging where it's like, yeah, this is not really ultimately where I belong. Mm -hmm. um, and the black experience in this country is pretty unique, pretty unique in history, I think, mm -hmm. um, has a lot to say to us, has a lot that we should examine and, and emulate. So um, while I'm sympathetic to say, well, we can't afford not to speak up. I would say the speaking up should not be done through political means because then you're just giving away your your strength. You already are strong. The black church is strong. The black community is strong. Mm -hmm. Like, don't abdicate that the way white folk have, <laughs> you know, continue to be strong in this society that the black church has given uh, gospel music has changed the world. Yeah. Black gospel music gave us rock and roll and pretty much everything else. Mm -hmm. I mean, it their experience has upended the world through their suffering and oppression. Yes. And was that right? No, but God used that. Mm -hmm. It was cruciform is what it was. Mm -hmm. It looked a lot like Jesus, you know? Well, that's and, um, James Cone, the cross and the lynching tree. Um, I don't know if you've read that. Uh, I have. It's so powerful. My gosh. How he, he, yeah, he correlates just, uh, how much of the atrocities committed against the black community the while that was happening the cross made so much sense and they clung to that and and there was so much correlation even between the lynching of innocent black people and the crucifixion of an innocent middle eastern jew um yeah it's it's i, I need to go back and read it again it was powerful um but it's, well, it's, it's what you're saying like yeah i would say to and i'm sympathetic you know uh, and, and, and my black friends who, who to saying we need to change this and but to do it by purely political means, mm -hmm. I want to say that don't make our mistake. <laughs> you know, don't don't we should emulate you. You don't emulate us. You've got it right. You know, yeah. that's what I'd say, I That's what I would say. And I know it's easy for us to say because we we are from a demographic that does have a kind of privilege in, in, the, in this particular society. But that's not the kind of privilege we're going for. Yeah. You know, don't chase that. Abdicate that in, in, in selfless, uh, sacrificial love, you know? Mm -hmm. um, it's almost like the way I think about it is, yeah, don't, don't put too much trust in, like, white progressives that they're actually after your self-interest. <laughs> or they're – sorry, that they're actually altruist, 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 yeah. altruist. They're not just – I can't even say the word altruistically they're, they're not they're not just motivated by this raw disdain for racism they are still after power and it's not it's the same thing with the church where i say that the 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 politicians the state have always tried to to take the church's power for their for their own political ends they're doing the same thing they see B blm as a big movement that they can co-opt for their own ends you know they see mm. the uh, racial justice uprising is something they can, they're always going to co-opt what you care about to gain mm -hmm. more power, or wh whatever it is. So don't give it away so easily. Mm -hmm. Don't give it away. Man, I, uh, Derek Bell, he's, 
like father of CRT, he talks about this in his essay back in the seventies, how the, during the civil rights movement, there was, I think he used a, what's the term convergence of interest that this attempt to address racism had all kinds of ulterior motives about trying to yep. look good to the nations with, you know, nations that had Brown people um, that they were trying to partner with in their battle against communism. And it's like, they, they were, they, they realized that their segregation laws w w weren't a good look <laughs> as they're trying to like, you know, win the hearts of these other nations. And so he's like, oh, don't, don't think like Brown versus the board of education was purely a disdain for race, racial segregation. Like there were, there was, there was, right. and I'm like that there's something there, man. I, I don't know enough about any of that to say, yes, that's true or no, but I'm like, that's a good, if it is true, that's a good example of, yeah, I just being not so quick to think that the, yeah, any kind of governmental attempt towards justice is really purely a concern for justice. I don't know. It's not. They, 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 if they cared about true justice, they would abdicate their power. I mean, they, 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 these, you can't do both, you know, it's, it's like that. They yeah. don't really want that. Yeah. They want that as much as they'll get your votes from it yeah. and get your campaign contributions from it. That's what they want. Yeah. You know, and so they agree with you in as much as will you vote for me if I say I agree? OK, cool. That's what they're always really saying. They're yeah. always really saying, oh, if I do and that Trump was just not very good at hiding it. They all do it. But he was so, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, he was repellent because he he didn't play the game very well. He did the same thing everyone else does. Like what he said out he, loud, everybody else is saying in secret or believing. He, in secret. he said he said the quiet thing out loud. Yeah. yeah. You know. I mean, he was clearly manipulating demographics, you know, and but and and people conflated things like white nationalism and evangelicalism just because Trump manipulated them both to get votes from them. They're not the same thing. He just said what he needed to say to get them to vote for him and support him. Yeah. You know, that's all he was doing. It was manipulation. But he just was not very good at being subtle about it. Yeah. And so it was abhorrent to so many people. Yeah. But. They're victims to whoever they're voting for is doing the same thing to them. Yeah. They just are a little, a little bit more clever and stealthy about it. So, I mean, I, we got to wrap things up, but I want to, I want to um, invite my uh, Patreon supporters to respond. I've never done this before. Um, and typically they do it anyway, but um, I would really love to hear from my Patreon supporters, not because they're, supporting the podcast, but just because if I just said, Hey, everybody respond to the podcast, I can't keep up with all that. And this is a smaller group of people who I know will listen probably to the whole thing. So, um, in the Patreon page, those of you who have access to that would love to, would love to hear your thoughts on this episode. Um, uh, and I'll probably say something in the intro about that as well, but Jay, thanks so much for your thoughts. Um, if this podcast is still around, uh, next week, <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm hey, honestly, I, I think us, what we're, what we're saying, it, it's a little uncut, unedited, there's some edges that could probably be trimmed off a little bit, but I think the heart of what we're saying resonates, I would say, with the majority of people who listen to this, first of all. But I think a lot of, well, hopefully a lot, maybe a growing number of Christians who are who have peeked behind the curtain and have seen like this whole back and forth political stuff, man. This 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 doesn't feel like Jesus, and we need to figure out another way. So, anarchy. <laughs> I'm gonna pick up that book. Jacques Alou. It's been on my reading list for about 20 years. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's very different than, than normal anarchy. Just keep that in mind. Christian yeah. anarchy is, but I think it's the right term. I think they should change their term. So, um, but it reminds anyway, me of I'll, Christian universalism and secular universalism. Like Christian universalism says that the blood of Jesus was so powerful that it overcomes unbelief and will usher everybody into the kingdom by virtue of the power of Jesus and him alone. That's very different than, oh, it doesn't matter who you worship, all roads lead to the same place, and Buddha right. is the same as Jesus right. is the same as this, you know. Th right? I mean, there's a, th th that same term, universalism, and then Christian universalism, so it's people yeah, conflate very, the two. Very but, different. Yeah. Very different. And, and yes, even though I uh, ultimately reject them both, I'm far more sympathetic to a kind of uh, biblical uh, universalism. Right. It, it, at least a coherent case can be made. One that I disagree with, but right, right. Um, I, I can respect where where someone's coming from. Where the other, I'm yeah. just like, 
that's just nonsense to me. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's totally. like, yeah. um, it's that you're Michael Gunger now, you know, you didn't, you know, you're not on Twitter. There was an uproar. He said that, uh, you know, uh, Jesus is the Christ. Buddha is the Christ. Muhammad is the Christ. And ever he's like, wow, you, you made everyone mad. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Like, no just, one was happy with the tweet. <laughs> it's just thought no. like there's there's a more thoughtful way of going about that kind of way of thinking. That that's I don't I have time for anybody's kind of perspective if it's thought out, if it's nuanced, using good language. I'm like, yeah, I would love to wrestle with that. But when it's just intellectually sloppy, it's like I don't, I just I, I don't have time for that. But well, he he doesn't have the touch that Richard Rohr has to walk mm. the line. He, he 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 jumps way over it into crazy town, but. Um, yeah. sorry, Michael, if you're listening to this, but you know, you're crazy. Yeah. Um, follow me on Instagram, follow me on Instagram, Newman family barbecue. Can I, I can't believe we didn't talk about barbecue this whole episode and I, I really got to go. So we can't bring it up now. Maybe next time. No, you can have me on to talk about barbecue next time because there's a lot of, uh, spiritual formation and discipleship that, it, that barbecue can teach us. And there's the Bible has a lot to say about barbecue as well. And I'm hoping to uh, uh, flesh out some of those thoughts. So, um, yeah, I've almost got uh, Joey Dotson agreeing with me that we'll eat meat in in the kingdom. Um, almost, he, almost. Mm. He would. Like, so, um, he at least gave me a point for saying, "Well, I can see that's possible, maybe." He's a but, vegan. Joey's a vegan, man. <laughs> he's a vegan, but he says it's not for eschatological reasons; it's for health reasons. That's okay. what he says. Yeah. Okay. Um, but Newman Family BBQ on Instagram, <laughs> if you like to look at meat. That sounds weird. I think but... I might pull out a tri-tip for tonight, actually. That sounds good. I'm hungry. You going to smoke it? Oh, yeah. We'll see. I, 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 if it's in the freezer, I might take. I might not have time. Shoot. I'm going to launch a Patreon, and uh, my barbecue advice is no longer free, so you'll have to join my Patreon to get <laughs> cooking tips. That's what I've been telling all my friends. It's not free anymore. Uh, you got to join. Got to join my club. Anyway, Preston, right. this was all awesome. yep. a good combo. It's all we always have a good combo. We were just we just recorded this one, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, let's let's finish offline right now. But I'll we'll sign out. Thanks for coming on theology in a row. Yeah, man. All right.